gathering in from the lands, from the east, from the west, from the north, and from the south. Let us pray. Almighty God, gracious Lord, we thank you that your Holy Spirit renews the church in every age. Pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep them steadfast in your word. Protect and comfort them in times of trial. Defend them against all enemies of the gospel and bestow on the church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
but do not do as they do. For they do not practice what they teach. They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on the shoulders of others. But they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. They love to have the place of honor at banquets and at the best seats in the synagogue, and to be greeted with respect in the marketplace, and to have people call them rabbi. But you are not to be called a rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all students. And call no one your father on earth, for you have one Father, the one in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. All who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. The Gospel of the Lord. Jenna Kim Jones was an intern on the Martha Stewart Show, the Daily Store Show with John Stewart, and the David Letterman Show. It was part of the due she had to pay for being a television producing and writing major at New York University. And that kind of major can find you putting yourself through school, working behind the counter of a candy store, which is exactly what Jenna did because even though she had internships, they were unpaid. Letterman finally hired her on a part-time basis until she got a full-time gig on the Daily Show with John Stewart. Up until now, this could be a story of any lucky person who majored in theater as an undergraduate. The joke about these poor souls is that sometimes their one and only line in show business is, would you like fries with that order? But there's a twist here. As you know, as they say in comedy, Letterman works clean. There may be a double entendre every once in a while, or a raised eyebrow on Dave's part when a guest gets too bawdy, but it's all pretty tame. John Stewart, on the other hand, does not. His show, while hilarious, is a language lesson. This is a sermon. So I'm going to leave that right there. But it leads me to the surprise that Miss Jones worked on The Daily Show because she is a Mormon. And one would think that the program would be off-putting to her Mormon sensibilities. She's not only a Mormon, she is the hostess and narrator of the new film they put out called Meet the Mormons. She never wavered from her faith. <clears throat> Instead, she reported, she clung to her religion like a trusted coat. She said, for the first time in my life, I felt like I really needed to understand who I was. It was time to dig in, figure it out, or not. She had more freedom than she'd ever known. Neither her mother nor father was around to monitor to her, to control her into going to church. Her brothers and sisters wouldn't tell on her if she didn't. It was all up to her. And she was surrounded by the countless distractions and temptations of Manhattan. 
Just walking to church, there are like 7,000 stores on the way, Jenna said, and they all look pretty amazing. One of the things that the Reformation brought to the life of faith was the freedom to choose. Before, in the West and the East, there was only one store. Now, there seems to be 7,000. But when most of us were growing up, Reformation Sunday was a day for giving thanks that we were not Roman Catholic. It was a day to carefully point out everything wrong with their church while glossing over the obvious faults of ours. Sometimes this led to bitter family battles. Sometimes it even led to bitter national battles. And when we were not making verbal or real war on each other, we were eyeing each other suspiciously. Not at all sure that the other was a Christian. This was another one of the blessings of growing up in an unchurched family as I did. Well, we know there was a battle going on. The Nelsons were kind of like Switzerland. We were neutral. Frankly, I think it served as another reason for my family members not to go to church. Who would want to be involved in that? Actually, I think they would have gone along with Jesus in today's gospel as he scathingly critiques what religious institutions can become. We can heed rule upon rule, regulation upon regulation upon each other. And then discover that nobody follows them anyway. I always hated when somebody who singles out the Pharisees for this behavior. First, because it's a short step to making the theological misstep of inferring that Christians are not like those Jews who cling to their legalistic religion. A step that has been historically proven to be far more dangerous than saying Lutherans are better than Roman Catholics. But second, and more importantly, it is a sneaky way of absolving ourselves of the notion that we are in any way like the Pharisees. That we are completely free of any Pharisaic tendencies to heap rule upon rule upon each other, and then discover that nobody is keeping any of them. Jesus is simply warning us that anything that distracts from our relationship with God is not healthy for our faith and can only serve to confuse. There is that strange line about the way scribes and the Pharisees dress. So, let me give you an example. When a guy named Tulian Chivitian became the senior minister of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, he announced that he was not going to wear a preaching robe like I have on now, because he thought that it was an unnecessary distraction that separated the clergy from the laity. There was an outcry because there had long been a tradition in that church for worship to be very, very formal, with their pastor, D.J. Kennedy, wearing not only a preaching gown, but an academic hood every Sunday. Now here's the part of the example. I think Jesus is getting it. When I have 45 minutes free, for that is how long Judea preaches, I watch him online. There is no way to put this mildly, but Judea is a star, and he knows it. Perfect smile, perfect floor 
part of tan, tight-fitting jeans and a form-fitting polo shirt, always with one more button unbuttoned than necessary. He is also tan. He has tattoos, and they are clearly visible, but almost indecipherable on this part of his arm. Now, he waves his arms a lot, far more even than I do, a behavior he clearly learned from his grandfather, Dr. Billy Graham, probably walked to preach and thought that that's the way to do it, you wave your arms a lot. However, his tattoos, it took me the better part of one of his sermons to figure out what was being said on his arms. Frankly, it drove me nuts. I hit the pause button on the computer over and over again, trying to freeze frame it, and then just missing the words. And to make matters worse, when I did see a glimpse of them, they were in Latin. I was becoming obsessed. I stopped caring about what he was preaching and focused instead on his arms. Finally, I got it. After numerous tries of pressing the streaming video, at just the right moment, I was able to read the words on one arm, which allowed me to guess what was probably written on the other. One arm had the word simul justus, and sure enough, when I got the other freeze framed, it had the words at Percato. It was Luther's formula that summed up the Reformation teaching. At the same time, Simul Justus et Precaim. We are justified, yet still sinners. Javidian's tattoos were a paradox, and not just for what Luther was trying to say to us about being saints and sinners at the same time. They were a paradox because they were the gospel, getting in the way of the gospel. I never heard a word he said in his sermon because figuring out those words captured my imagination like no set of vestments ever could. I think that's what Jesus was getting at. We live in a culture where we are surrounded by 7,000 stores. We may shop at a store called wealth or appearance or individualism or materialism. We may do all we can to make ourselves healthier, wealthier, and wiser. We may sacrifice or have sacrificed for our children's future, hoping to make their lives better than ours were. But we leave without faith, and all we find ourselves living with are distractions. Our lives are no center, no grounding, no first principles to which we can turn when we face a crisis in life. And didn't we need that this week, when every moment seemed to bring a crisis greater than the one before? Not only the extremist forces of ISIS running rampant through the Middle East, but a self-radicalized gunman shooting up the halls of the Canadian Parliament after gunning down an unarmed soldier.
writing Canada's war memorial. Another self-radicalized crazy running over and killing a Canadian soldier and injuring another with a car. An axe wielding, self-claiming to be self-radicalized, nut job, attacking police in the streets of New York City. And as if this weren't enough news for 10,000 news cycles. A beautiful young man, a homecoming prince, an athlete, who was seen to be a rising star among his Tulip tribe of First Nations people, reportedly upset over a breakup with his girlfriend, walks into a high school cafeteria, shoots four people, two of whom were his cousins, before killing himself. Perhaps what Jesus is saying is that his church then, his church now, is worrying about the wrong things. When churches and people stop criticizing and bickering with each other, when we stop worrying about whether or not or what kind of vestments our pastors wear, Even thinking about whether or not they have a tattoo. In my case, you will never know. But when we refocus our energies and resources and time on being kind and generous and just, we'll really become the servants that God wants and can use. seems to me face the same choice that Jenna Kim Jones faced. There are at least 7,000 temptations that will lure us away from Christ and being the kind of people God wants us to be. And now is a good time to dig in, figure it out now. I love the way Dr. Eugene Peterson paraphrases Jesus' words in his book, The Message. Do you want to stand out? Let's step down. Be a servant. If you puff yourself up, you'll get the wind knocked out of you. But if you're content simply to be yourself, your life will count for plenty. In this world, at this time, serve Christ. And among the 7,000 stories, you'll stand out, and your life will count for plenty. Thanks for listening.
the blessing of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go with you this day and forevermore.